good prayer worked, and, and thank you, Emmanuel, for reading that introduction just the way I wrote it. I appreciate that very much. I'm very thankful to be a part of this school. As you know, I've known it since its beginning, since I was, I tell people when I go on the road, maybe you've heard me say this before, that I uh, left this congregation in 1983, tried to go and become a preacher, and then about 1994, they decided, I think we better start a school. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have inherited a lot of good work that a lot of people have done, and I benefit from a lot of people's work at this time. I just kind of get the credit for a lot of things that a lot of other people do. People like our diligent and hardworking and intelligent secretary, Michelle McIntyre, and our elders who labor tirelessly for this school. Emmanuel first, and then Denver Cooper did a great job in preparing this school and getting it going during its first 18 years and establishing a curriculum and a faculty, getting facilities and raising money to get it paid for. This congregation, unnamed people who have gone on to their rewards and some who are still laboring behind the scenes, this is a monumental undertaking. It may seem small, but it's on a volunteer basis pretty much. And those volunteers band together to make something happen that could not happen with one or two people or could not happen even in the business world with the selfishness that resides there. Thank you all for making this kind of work very possible. You, as children of God, must be very disturbed at the wickedness that is in the world. I can't tell you how long it's been that I've had this feeling. Wake up Monday morning, see what's going to spiral downward that week. See what kind of scandal is going to come out of Washington that's not going to go answered that week. See what kind of shooting there's going to be. See what kind of Planned Parenthood video is going to surface. See what kind of far-reaching motives and far-reaching agenda the LGBT community has to shut down Christianity in America. And make no mistake about it, that is their stated goal. See what kind of agenda the ACLU has that week to try and shut down Christianity, the American uh, Center for Religious Freedom, Freedom From Religion Foundation. See what kind of damage they're doing to our country. And you mourn and your heart is heavy at wickedness. Your doctor might give you a pill for it, and that's okay. Sometimes there are chemical imbalances. Don't get me wrong. But there were biblical characters who were just as depressed over just seeing the wickedness that is in the world. Remember that Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I don't believe he was only talking about the incredible grief that you feel with the passing of a loved one. I believe he was talking about those who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in their homeland and the world abroad. The wickedness just mounts up. I tell you, I've been having a good week for a couple of reasons. One, no TV, and two, no time to be on the internet. But what I did before I came here was I did a quick check of some headlines to see if, oh well, there might be any wickedness that was coming up in the headlines. I'll let you be the judge. In Iran, they're reporting that there are still lashings, blindings, and amputations that are barbarically used for punishment. In the United Kingdom, there's a website where young female college students can go to sign up to sell their sex in order to pay for their college tuition. Another Planned Parenthood video has surfaced that advocates burning fetuses. Well, I suppose that's better than selling them. No, it isn't. Impeachment over an illegal, unjust targeting of conservatives by the IRS. Genocide with forced cannibalism before people were put to death. Cop throws a girl to the ground. The wickedness just overwhelms your heart. It, wasn't, it isn't us alone. It's been that way in every age. I suppose as you get a little bit older, you become a little bit more attuned to it. I would still argue that it's getting worse and worse in our country, in our era. We used to be a country that cared somewhat about truth and justice. We used to be a country that cared somewhat about a higher moral law. You know, when Hitler's minions were on trial in Nuremberg, their defense was, we were following the laws of our land. The judge, who was from Jamestown, New York, said, there is a higher law than the law of your land. Now there's a conflict that rages in our judicial system 
between those justices who say there is something called natural law that is a higher law than any land, an ethical system, a moral system that is higher than any particular individual, and then there are those who espouse legal positivism, which is a fancy way of saying the judges write the law as they go. They don't believe in a God. They don't believe in social morals. They believe even that cannibalism might be okay in some countries as long as it's accepted socially. These are the judges that feel like they can rewrite God's laws. Do you wonder then, since there's this conflict, that there is always this give and take, this back and forth, this nuclear option about the filibuster to try and sequester, to try and stop the judicial nominees or to keep the judicial nominees going because that's where the law goes. I've been thinking that way for a while, studied it for a while, and then last week found a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great uh, judicious judicial mind of America in the 20th century that said essentially what I mean by law is the educated guesses that legislatures make as to whether the judges will uphold it or not. In other words, he is saying that when legislatures make law, that law is only good after a judge confirms it as okay. In other words, we are ruled by a tyranny and oligarchy right now of judges who believe in legal positivism rather than believe in natural overarching moral law. Is it any wonder we get the decisions that we do? The wickedness just depresses your heart. But it is not us alone. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 1, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Let, let me talk to you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper and why are they happy who deal so treacherously? They're wicked. That shouldn't bring them happiness. That shouldn't bring them life. That should not bring them joy. And yet it seems to. Job, who was tortured with his health and tortured with the loss of his family, said in Job chapter 21, starting at verse 7, Why do the wicked live and become old, yes, become mighty in power? Their descendants are established before them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. They're all living in a good family atmosphere. There's nothing to worry about. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. In modern language, that would be their stock market. Their stocks never take a dip. They're always going up. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the flute. One thing that I've observed in my adult life is this, that you can judge the freedom and you can judge the moral law of a country by whether the children are playing or crying most of the time. What do you think the children are doing in Syria most of the time right now? What do you think the children are doing in Iraq most of the time right now? As ISIS comes and finds those who are of accountable age and says confess Muhammad or die, Sometimes it doesn't happen to the wicked, though. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the flute. They spend all their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. They spend all their days luxuriously. Everything's always given to them. They were born with a silver spoon in their mouth, and then they don't even have to suffer before they die. They just drop. And yet they say to God, Depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? Job wondered about it. Jeremiah wondered about it. I wondered about it. And now we study an answer to it that frankly is one of the hardest passages in the Bible for me to obey. It's a psalm, but it's a psalm written from David to God that seems to be teaching us as well. You know how some of our songs go directly to God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And you know how some of our songs go towards each other? If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. This one seems to go both directions to me, toward God and toward each other. Here's what you're supposed to do about evil. Here's what you're supposed to do about wickedness. Here's what you're supposed to do about dealing with these things on this earth. I gotta pause here, I usually don't do this, but I'm getting real dry. Could one of you students bring me a bottle of water, please, while I'm preaching? I'd appreciate that. The 37th Psalm is our text for what to do when you get so downhearted about the wickedness in the world. The first point is simply this, do not fret. Verses 1 and 2, 
Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Thank you so much. Excuse me. The word fret there means to be hot, hot-spirited, hot in temper. Hot, it's used in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 11, where Samuel has just learned that Saul has lost his kingdom. He's the one who anointed Saul. When he hears that Saul's losing his kingdom, it grieves him, and he's very angry, and he cries out to the Lord all night. That's fretting. That's hotness of spirit. The word is used in Genesis chapter 34, verse 7, when the brothers of Dinah find out that she's been raped, they're, hang they're angry, and rightfully so. It's used in Genesis 31, verse 36, where Jacob is wroth with Laban. I have that backwards in the book. I hope you'll forgive the error. That's the kind of hotness of spirit that is used here in Psalm 37, verse 1. Don't do it because of evildoers. I tell you, I've had more trouble obeying that command than about any in the Bible. I get so angry when I see all this wickedness going on. There is injustice in the world. And I suppose there's some sort of anger that needs to be when you see that sort of thing. Jesus saw self-righteous Pharisees who were going to object to him healing a man because it was on the Sabbath. And he looked at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their heart. Mark chapter 3 verse 5. And then you know what he did in the temple when he saw the money changers there. Yet we're not supposed to fret because of evildoers. I suppose it's like that old illustration that's often used about lust. What if you see a woman? Well, what if you have an angry thought pass your mind? Well, it's one thing to let a bird land on your head, but it's another thing to let him build a nest there. That bird might land there, but take him away. Do not fret about it. How can we not fret about all this wickedness in the world? Well, the rest of the psalm answers it. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Grass mowing season is just about over for this year. Thank goodness. <laughs> I joke about that, but I enjoy mowing the grass. And oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? I've been to the places that are brown. I've been to the places that are dried up. I've been to the places that are ready for kindling, ready to be fire. And I'd much rather have the green grass grow in the cut every week, but you know it never gets too tall because it's cut down. The grass is used as a symbol for the temporary nature of man in Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8, and is used in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, to contrast to the permanent nature of God's word and those who follow it. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. In James chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. How's the rich going to be humiliated? Because as the flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than the grass withers, its flower fades, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man will be in all his pursuits. Here's a promise from God that those who are wicked in this life are not going to last very long. But they've been lasting all my lifetime. I've been watching this country die for 30 years because of the immorality. It's been lasting in other nations all over the world. There's been genocide. There's been Islamo-fascists who were trying to take over the world since about 600 A.D. How long is it going to last, O oh Lord? You know we're not alone in asking that question, don't you? How many times have you heard Revelation 6, 9 through 11 referenced this week? How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then to each one of them was given a white robe, and it was said that they should wait a little while longer until the blood of their fellow servants would be spilled as theirs were, paraphrase. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. God promises to help us, you know. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Now here's an important point for understanding this psalm and some things that come later. We're talking about here the land of Canaan. We're talking about an Old Testament prophecy. We're talking about an Old Testament psalm that has to do with the people dwelling permanently in the land that God would give them, at least permanently for the time period that God intended for them to be there up until the Christ came. If they would be the kind of people that he wanted them to be, they would have that land. 
Remember God promised Abraham with the land promise in Genesis 13, 14, and 15. Look, look northward, southward, eastward, westward. All the land that you see, you're going to inherit it someday. Your descendants will inherit that. In Genesis 15, verse 7, I brought you up out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees to bring you to this land to inherit it. But then when Moses brought the children of Israel up out of Egypt some 400 years later, there were warnings given. They would be blessed if they obeyed God, but if they cursed God, for example, in Deuteronomy 28, verses 30 and 6 and 37, if they disobeyed God, God would take them and the king they set over them and drive them to a nation that they had not known and they would serve other gods and they would become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword to all the nations where they had been driven. <laughs> oh, there's Israel. What's an astonishment? Ooh, look what happened to Israel. What's a byword? Ah, oh, you're going to get yours like Israel did. What's a proverb? Ah, oh, Israel disobeyed and if you disobey, they'll get God. They would become that if they disobeyed God. It's succinctly stated in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Now the change starts to be made when we get to the new covenant, and you can see it in one particular commandment. In the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, and it will be well with you, and you will live land, long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, Exodus chapter 20. But you know that that's quoted in Ephesians chapter 6 as the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Well, originally it meant that if you honor your father and mother, generally it's going to be well with people around you in society, and you're going to be able to inherit the land of Canaan. You learn respect for authority in the home. You'll respect authority outside of the home. You'll respect the authority of God. You'll live long in the land of Canaan. But now then it's used in Ephesians chapter 6 to say you got better chances at living longer if you obey your parents, and don't you? I remember going to the funeral of a 17-year-old one time who died in some kind of accident because he'd been drinking, and I remember his parents commenting we always knew he wouldn't make it till age 18 because he'd been so disobedient. It's not to say the good never die young, but generally if you have halfway decent parents and you listen to them, you got a chance of living longer. But there's something even better. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. How am I supposed to delight myself in the Lord until the wickedness stops? That's the mistake I've been making. Wait till Monday. Maybe it'll be better next week. Then I'll be happy. Wait till Tuesday. Maybe it'll be better this week. Maybe somebody, something will get done about these things. Maybe something will be done about these scandals. Maybe charges will be filed. Maybe ISIS will be stopped. And then I'll be happy. But you can't wait for that. Jesus said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad when you're persecuted, didn't he? In Matthew 5, verse 12. Jesus came to give the abundant life, John chapter 10, verse 10, and yet just a few chapters later, he's telling his apostles that the world would hate them. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That word commit in verse 5 is the word that's used for taking a boulder or a burden a boulder-like burden that is on you and rolling it off onto somebody else. Now, that wouldn't be real kind, would it? George was just kind enough to bring me a bottle of water. If I had a big car laying on me sometime and I had one of my, you know, frequent bursts of superhuman strength <clears throat> and, and rolled that car over onto George to get it off of me, that wouldn't be too kind. But that doesn't have to happen in that scenario. That can't happen in that scenario. That's a silly illustration. But I have a heavy burden on me with the wickedness of the people around me. And here is the word that means to commit your works to the Lord, commit your way to the Lord. It's used in, in Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Just move it over to God. He can bear it. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Have you ever been falsely accused? If you haven't been, maybe you're not working hard enough. I don't know. Jesus said you're blessed when people falsely accuse you and persecute you in Matthew chapter 5. Bless you if you've never been falsely accused. I've been falsely accused and had to rely on this verse thinking someday it's going to come to light. But this verse is far more than about me and my piddly little circumstances, do you realize how much injustice in the world never goes answered in this world? 
I wonder if Alexander the Great was ever punished for any of his crimes against humanity in conquering the world the way that he did. Well, he died at 33 years of age. He wept before he died because he didn't have any more lands to conquer. Was he ever really punished? Did he ever get any kind of torture? Did he ever do the things, anybody ever do the things to him that he did to them? I doubt it. But someday, there will be justice, and someday there will be retribution. God will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Remember, Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 17, For there is nothing secret that will not be revealed, and nothing hidden that will not be known and come to light. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, he told us, told us when that would be, Paul told us when that would be, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul said, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of heart. the heart, then each one's praise will come from God. God will bring forth your righteousness. Truth will prevail. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. It only causes harm. You know, don't you? All the time that I've been angry about the wickedness against ISIS, nobody from ISIS ever wrote me and said, we're really sorry you're angry about this. They don't know that I'm angry about that. They don't care that I'm angry about that. I'm only hurting me and my dear wife who has to listen to me and the people around me that see me depressed. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. It only causes harm. For, verse 9, evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I posted this passage on Facebook a while ago when I was studying it, and a friend commented, I never knew that Jesus in the, in the Beatitudes was basing what he said on an Old Testament principle and an Old Testament psalm. Thank you for posting that. You see, people take Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, and they run with it to premillennial ends, don't they? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, Jesus said. Well, that's based upon this psalm, Psalm 37, that's based upon the idea that if the meek would just hold out and wait for the wickedness to end, then they would receive the land of Canaan, then they would be established in the land of Canaan, the wicked would be cut off from the land of Canaan, but those who were meek would be established in the land of Canaan, they would be established in the earth, they would be established in the land. People who are wicked eventually get their due and eventually get their punishment, and those who are meek rise up and at least for a time take over in that particular land. Well, Jesus is not promising a millennial kingdom where there will never be anybody but meek people. He is not promising a thousand-year reign on earth. He is simply stating the Old Testament principle that meekness, righteousness, truth, justice eventually wins because God is still on his throne no matter how wicked this world and all its nations may seem to be. Meekness wins. And this meekness is not about inheriting the earth, but as Brother May pointed out earlier today, this kind of physical blessing in the Old Testament is spiritualized in the New Testament to where we look forward to something much, much better. Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 16, and 17, for the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Where's Christ now? Is he on earth? No. Is he ever coming back to earth? No. We'll meet him in the air, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we are joint heirs with Christ. Where? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved 
in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. The meek shall inherit the earth. The meek will the ones who go to, are the ones who are going to go to heaven. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out, Proverbs 24, verses 19 and 20. In this psalm, then, we see, besides do not fret, not to fret about evil, we're not supposed to fear about evil either, because there will be a recompense someday. In verse 12, the psalmist goes on to say that the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. You know what the gnashing of teeth is, don't you? The gnashing of teeth is something you do when you're really angry. When Stephen preached to the Jews and said, you're stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, made them angry. They were pricked in the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth, picked up rocks, and stoned him to death. Psalm 35, verse 16, with ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth, the psalmist says about his enemies. The wicked plots against the just. He gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. I don't think that the idea is, I know that the idea is not that the Lord finds it humorous that his people are being persecuted. The Lord laughs at him. What you see there is a poetic picture. It'd be kind of like, you know, if Andy Robinson went up to Michael Jordan and challenged him to a game of basketball. <laughs> oh, son, come on. <laughs> the wicked plots against the just and tries to do everything he can to get him, and the Lord says, oh, son, you don't know what you're doing to yourself. The wicked have drawn the sword. They have bent the bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are upright in heart. The sword and the bow, weapons of war, weapons of destruction. I will set the point of the sword against all the gates of the city, Ezekiel 21 says, that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasped for the slaughter. Swords at the ready, thrust right. Swords at the blade, thrust left. Set your blade, thrust left. Wherever the edge is ordered. That was the command of the sword of Babylon against Israel. The people who were wicked set their sword against those who were righteous. But you know what's going to happen? The sword shall enter their own heart and their bow shall be broken. David threw a lot of spears, or sorry, Saul threw a lot of spears at David, but Saul ended up falling on his own sword. Better a little that a righteous man has than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And don't you love that picture? Imagine a person, a bunch of group, a rich, a group of rich people sitting at a feast with the finest dining that you could ever have, but all of their arms are broken. Nobody can feed anybody else, as that one illustration old goes. Nobody can do anything for any, all of their arms are broken. Better a little that the righteous has than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken. They shall be powerless. Do not fear, because there will be a recompense. Do not fear, because there will be a remnant. The Lord knows the days of the upright, verse 18, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the day of famine they shall be satisfied. Famine was one of the means that God used to punish people, to punish nations who were against him, Ezekiel 14, verses 13 and 21. But this remnant would last, and in the days of famine they would be satisfied. Remember that all through the Old Testament, there's that teaching of the remnant so that God could save the people of Israel so that they, through them, could come the Christ as he had promised through Abraham. When they would have these famines then, when they would have these wars, there would always be that remnant. It's pictured most apocalyptically and, and powerfully, I think, in Ezekiel chapter 9, when Ezekiel has a vision of a bunch of guys, six guys coming with battle axes, ready to destroy Jerusalem. And then another man is seen who has a writer's inkhorn at his side, and he is told to go and mark on the foreheads all those who sigh and cry, those who are mourning, those who are weeping, over the abominations of Jerusalem. And then those ones with the mark on their forehead because they're sorry about sin, they can't stop it, but they're sorry about it, they're the ones who survive the slaughter. Do not fear because there will be a remnant. And do not fear because there will be a retreat. Verse 20, the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord. Like the splendor of the meadow, they shall vanish into smoke, they shall vanish away. That word splendor is translated fat in the King James Version and others. 
The word meadows translated lambs in the King James Version. These are two words, best I can tell, but people just can't figure out what they mean. Matter of fact, the word lamb is also translated battering ram or an enclosed riding space on a camel's saddle. I don't get the divergence in meaning that this word has in translation. The word splendor means valuable, prized, weighty. So different translations have, like the splendor of the meadow, they shall vanish away. Like the fat of the lamb, they shall vanish away. You burn the fat on the altar, it would vanish away very quickly. It would go up into smoke. Probably seems the best image of all of this. What he's saying, though, is the best of the best vanish away into smoke at some time. All these wicked will someday retreat. So don't fret about them and certainly don't fear them. Thirdly, do not forget. Do not forget that there is a contrast. Verse 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, and those cursed by him shall be cut off. There's the inheriting of the earth again. What's the difference here? The wicked borrows and does not repay. Well, all through the Bible, we have these passages that are against rich people oppressing the poor. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will eat your flesh like fire, will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Indeed, the wages of the laborers, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. What a picture. The wages, not the laborers, the wages of the laborers cry out. And their cries have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You've kept them back by fraud. And the wages cry out to God and say, listen, we've been kept back by fraud. And God hears it. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. But weep and howl, he says, for your miseries that are coming upon you. Jeremiah 17, verse 11, as a partridge that broods but does not hatch. The translations are multitudinous again. you got a partridge that has eggs and sits on it but it won't hatch. Or a partridge that goes to other eggs that aren't hers and then the babies hatch and they leave her is the idea. However that is, so the rich man will be in all his pursuits. His riches will leave him. And his, at the end of his days, he will be as a fool. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. Don't forget that. Those blessed by him will inherit the earth and those cursed by him will be cut off. Do not forget that, they're, that the righteous are conquerors. Verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Proverbs 24, 16 says, a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by his calamity. Verse 25 was mentioned earlier today. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Now someone says, well, what about Lazarus? As was mentioned earlier today, and I agree with Dr. May, I think just some, this is a general rule, and sometimes there might be exceptions. But isn't it what Jesus promised as a general rule? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man will be rewarded. A good man will receive the things that is needed. He is ever merciful and lends. He doesn't hoard things to himself. He's always lending and things come back to him and God blesses him. It doesn't make sense. How are you going to make sure you have everything you need if you give things away to people sometime? Well, that's how God says to do it, so it does make sense. The righteous who trust in God are conquerors. Do not forget that. And then do not forget that there are consequences. Depart from evil, verse 27, and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice. Really? The Lord loves justice, then why are you letting all this go on? This is the atheist's argument against the existence of God. Why is there evil in the world? I sat with an 18-year-old not too long ago and talked to him about the existence of God. His objection, children suffer. Nobody ever goes to jail for it. Pedophiles don't get caught. People do these things and people suffer. But listen, do you realize, I asked him, that if there is no God, they'll never get any justice. If there is no God, then that person has, that kills a child has taken everything from that child. If there is a God, then that child goes to heaven, and someday that impenitent pervert will get 
and eternity in hell for the wicked deeds that he did. If there is no God, there is no justice. The Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Do not forget that. And then finally, do not falter because there are real fruits of righteousness. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Listen, folks, you are the people who can get wisdom and justice into this world to some degree. Wisdom and justice come from God, and they come from God's people. Remember that that was the prophecy of the Christ in a couple of different places. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7 or Isaiah 11 starting at verse 1 there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots meaning from the lineage of David would come the Christ the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord his delight is in the fear of the Lord he will not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears but watch this with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness is the belt of his loins and faithfulness is the belt of his waist. Christ brought, came into this world to establish the church and to bring some sense of righteousness and justice. Where there is the church, where there are Christians, there are people who call out, on behalf of the widows, on behalf of the orphans, on behalf of those who are oppressed, on behalf of those who are, who are chided, on behalf of those who are cheated, where there is no Christ, there is no such hint of these things. Go to a Muslim world where the women can be beaten just as much as a man wants to. Go to Afghanistan where the American Center for Law and Justice reports that the police force that we're helping regularly sexually abuse boys tied to post on a regular basis and our troops aren't allowed to say anything about it. Where there's no Christ, there is no justice. But where Christ goes, justice follows. And you're the people to say, the mouth, on the mouth of the righteous is wisdom. And his tongue speaks of justice. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked therefore watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Do not falter because there are, going, there are real fruits of righteousness. When there are righteous people, they bring some kind of good to this world. They bring some kind of hope that children don't have to cry all the time but can have some play and can go to the tambourine and the harp but do it in righteousness and not in wickedness. There is finality in judgment. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. Now watch this. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. You know, sometimes I go to bed and I just repeat that one over and over to myself. <laughs> when the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Would you like a list of the people that I'd like to see in prison at this time? <laughs> I mean, you know, when the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I don't understand that. I don't get it. I don't know that it's literal. I don't think that it's literal. I think it's figurative. But oh, how, po how poetry can ring true to the heart. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. And when the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away. Behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought carefully for him, but he could not be found. Where's Hitler? Where's Mussolini's regime? Statue of Lenin was dressed up like Darth Vader the other day. Where's this? Where did these wicked people go? Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. But transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. And the Lord will help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. 
I'll never see wickedness evaporate from this earth unless the Lord comes while I'm alive, and then I probably won't see it. I must gain my delight by a simple trust that God's way overcomes. That's the only way in which I can rejoice. That doesn't mean that there won't be tears. You know the Philippian letter is famous for Paul's joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, but in another chapter he writes, I tell you this even with tears in the same letter. Don't fret because of evil people. Don't fear them. Don't forget that the righteous are conquerors. And don't falter. Because there are fruits of righteousness, there's finality and judgment, and there are conflicting futures. Which do you want your future to be? Revelation 22, verse 8 is often quoted. But the cowardly unbelieving, abominable, sorcerers, murderers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know what the verse before it says? He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I want to trust in the Lord for a place that I expect to see someday where nobody wicked gets to get within 10,000 miles of me because they're not allowed in the city of God. Revelation 21, verse 27, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. What comfort. But friend, you don't have it if you're not right with God. You'll share an eternity in hell with the likes of a Mussolini and a Hitler if you're not right with God. God spells out that sin is sin. And God spells out that there is punishment for all those who are not saved. That great passage about being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ in Romans 8, complemented by that great passage in Galatians chapter 4 about having God's spirit in our hearts so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. That passage in Galatians 4 follows this in Galatians chapter 3. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That is, as was stated earlier, everybody from every nation comes all together to have some sort of justice, to have some sort of camaraderie, to have some sort of fellowship together in fighting against the wickedness of this world. And then if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise that gave Ab God gave to Abraham. But you have to be righteous to do that. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. Not mark the man who does things once in a while right and does the rest of the time whatever he wants. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright. Well, how do you become blameless? Well, you confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. That passage in Romans 8 about being his heirs follows closely on the heels of the passage in Romans 6 about being baptized in the likeness of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You put away the old man of sin. You rise to walk in newness of life. You are no longer yours. You don't belong to you. You don't do what you want to do all the time. You do what God wants you to do all the time. And therefore, you are his. Therefore, you belong to him. You have Christ as your elder brother. You have God as your father. You're an heir of God in Christ. And you can look forward to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. But if you're not faithful in those regards, you don't have it. And you better fret. You better not sleep until you get things right with God. And if we could help you tonight, would you please come forward as we stand and sing to encourage you.